recording the oral history interview of Glenn Cleland, 17th Armored Infantry Battalion, 12th Armored Division, World War II, taking the interview 1st of August, 2013, at the 12th Armored Division Reunion, St. Louis, Missouri. Well, sir, first I want to thank you for agreeing to sit down and talk to me. I'm glad to do it. And uh, we'd like to start out uh, before the war. How did you grow up? Where did you grow up, and how did you learn that the, the war was coming? Well, I was born in 1920 on a farm west of Rochester, Indiana. Grew up as a farm boy in a family of seven kids, and both of my parents still alive. Of course, at that time, it was all horse, horse farming. So I grew up uh, around horses, and my dad always kept about 20 cows to milk and, and he never owned an acre of ground but he was a always planted a lot of corn and soybeans and oats for horses and and I learned how to work and and uh, so I I think I done my share and and, uh, and I grew up uh, graduated from Rochester High School and 1939, and uh, Dad was still in the farming business. I I stayed with Dad until till uh, 1940. Well, yeah, about in early 1942. Uh, I had a little luck in getting a job. My Dad was hauling. Uh, yellow corn into the canning factory and, and hauling the cobs and the shucks and things away to a farm house to, for to insulage for cattle feed. And uh, one evening at about 9.30 at night, I I'd unloaded, had the load unloaded and I was headed back to the canning factory and I come to a curve in the road and I got my sleeve or, caught in the spinner on the spinning or in the first steering wheel went through a farmer's fence but the farmer also had owned three livestock semi trailers the next week he called me and wanted to know if I'd like to drive for him not a very good in uh, way to get hired but so I talked to my dad about it he said well go ahead this was at the time that Horses was going out of style. We lived, we lived a long ways from Kansas City, Missouri, but he had a buyer in Valley Falls, Kansas, which was not too far from uh, from Kansas City. That was buying horses by the truckload and sending them to Bucyrus, Ohio. They run through a sale on Tuesdays. So I, I worked from early spring until up late September or early October hauling horses from Kansas City or Valley Falls to, to Bucyrus, Ohio. Uh, in fact, is two loads of them went to, to on to New Jersey. So I was kept busy that way. I, I'm, I'm an ex-truck driver and I'm an ex-farm worker. So. How did you come to be in the service? Well, I had a good friend that was, uh, he didn't want to, he didn't want to get in the Army, he wanted in the Navy. And he talked me into going with him to Indianapolis to, to an examination and test. And he passed the test and I didn't because I couldn't, I couldn't tell the different shades of yellow and orange in the flags. I knew red, white, and blue and stuff, but a little little difference in color confused me. So I, I wasn't any good for sending messages or anything, so that's how I, I had to wait till they drafted me then. And I, when I went with a busload of other people, I, uh, there was uh, six of us that was sent to the 12th Armored Division, and there was, I think, some 50-some on the load, on the bus load, but Six of us ended up in the 12th Armored Division. Now, uh, where did you do your basic training at? 
What was that again? Where, where did you do your training, your basic training? Well, uh, the basic training was at uh, Camp Camel, Kentucky. This is, uh, the camp wasn't completely built yet. Uh, when, you, when you walked in the, the barracks, you was about four to six inches taller than you was when you got the mud off of the, all of your feet. So uh, it was pretty messy. A lot of red clay. But then uh, I, of course, we had to go through the basics to learn the, how to handle a rifle and right shoulder and left shoulder and all this. And then uh, we finally, uh, after you done some of that, why they appointed the uh, different platoons. And I got in a 30 caliber water cooled machine gun platoon at four four squads, four different leaders, and I was appointed the leader of one of the, the squads. Uh, that's more or less the way it worked. And the headquarters company was the heavy equipment company for the battalion. Uh, we had 30 caliber water-cooled machine guns. They had 50 caliber air-cooled. We had 81 caliber mortars, and they had 60 caliber. Uh, uh, and we had uh, four light tanks with 37 millimeter assault guns. And of course, the letter companies didn't have them. Was, they had principally rifle squads. We didn't have a rifle squad in our in our company. Otherwise, it was pretty much the same. So that's about all I can tell you about that. I guess. Now, uh, did you participate in the Tennessee maneuvers? Yes, yes, I, I went through the Tennessee maneuvers like the rest of them. Uh, it, it was good exercise for, for higher ups as well as for the enlisted man. And uh, uh, we done rather well uh, compared to other, other battalions or other uh, divisions that was working with us too, so uh, uh, they, but they wanted us to have more, more uh, work done, and they was in the in the in the situation that we didn't have battalions at that time. We had regiments. Com companies worked with regiments. Well, regiments was they three times bigger than a battalion. So they divided us up into battalions and made us smaller units, which made us all faster and quicker. And uh, way I ended up in I ended up in headquarters company of the Seventh Infantry Battalion that way. So I'm, I'm I was in a I was in a good outfit. I I was proud of it. Okay, what can you tell me about Camp Barkley? Well, Camp Barkley was a new camp too, uh, but it didn't have the red clay, but uh, and it had smaller barracks. We had the smaller barracks, eight, eight, eight uh, men to a to a hut. Hut they called them. It was nothing but uh, some two by fours and plywood put together and and uh, nailed together and uh, set out in the prairie of. Texas and we in the wind and the dust and snow in the winter and, and uh, a, a lot different but then uh, but it was good training uh, we wasn't babied around like we was at Camp Barkley and we we ended up uh, doing a lot of a lot of training it was we're still on the camp but we would maybe be 12 to 20 miles from from our barracks and uh, we learned a lot. Uh, I, I was I was satisfied with it, and I think the higher ups worked too. Okay, so from Camp Barkley, it's overseas. Now, uh, tell me about your trip from New York to uh, oh well to England. Yeah, well, I think uh, when we went from. Abilene to New York, I think they sent us on about eight different railroads, different ra ways. Some of them, some of them went through Chicago and to New York, and 
some went to through Atlanta to, then on to New York and we all we all split up but we all got to New York presumably about the same time and uh, no no particular problems on that then they loaded us on they gave us a I think a two or three day furlough or we were supposed to be able to go into New York they didn't want us to get any further away we spent a couple of days in New York and back to back to camp to board ship and uh, we got on an English English transport U.S. or Empress of Australia and uh, some of the units had gone on ahead of us earlier but uh, the boat or the boat was pretty well loaded we had a uh, a uh, major that was was the head of uh, guard duty on the boat promised us all a, a leave of absence if we got to England, but that never took place. So we, we, but uh, he didn't stay with the outfit too long after they got overseas either. And uh, uh, we had a we had a, a slow trip going across because of the zigzag routes that we took and. But uh, no no boats in our convoy was lost or anything. Made it all right. We ended in Liverpool, England, in the dark. So uh, that's about all I can tell you about that. Yeah. So, how was England as compared to America when you, when you left America and and wound up there? Well, of course, England is pretty wet, we, and we slept in tank tents. Uh, and it was cool and cool and misty and foggy. It, it was an entirely different weather. But, uh, I did did uh, get a three-day pass into London uh, with another soldier from our company, and uh, we was uh, we happened to be in London when they had some buzz bombs. Uh, come over, scare you to death, but then uh, uh, we lived through it, I guess. Uh, and But we, we got some good training, too. Uh, we went ahead and trained uh, just like we would in the States while we was in England. They didn't, they didn't ease up any. So, but, but when we got ready to go across, uh, they had already had the, it was later than the invasion, and but we still saw all the stuff in the channel that they had to bother us with, and so, uh, but we made it in good shape in England. And we had to find out, we had new equipment, we got new equipment that they had had come into England and stored there for us to take over. So, uh, that's, yep. That was the story on that. Okay, then across the channel into France, Yes, yeah, still stayed with my friends across the channel and we didn't lose anybody. And, uh, it was an experience I wouldn't want to go through again, but then uh, it, we, we, a lot of them had it worse than we did, I'd have to say. They broke the, they broke the, the ribbon for us. <laughs> now, can you tell me about your first experience in combat? Well, the uh, first experience in combat was we was up uh, in the, uh, I don't know whether the Maginot Line or the other line that they have there, that, but we was getting pretty close to, to Germany at that time. But uh, you couldn't see anybody shoot it and shooting at you or anything, but we had gunfire coming our way, but it was well hid in the bunkers and such as that. and. Uh, uh, we didn't. We couldn't figure out where the where the shells was coming from, and and uh, but we got a good we got a good initiation anyway. We didn't get anybody killed at first, but then we we learned how to protect ourselves and how to dig foxholes, and and uh, we didn't get like I say we didn't get anybody killed the first few days, but. Uh, 
I, I, I guess that's about, about all I can remember about the first few days of it. We, we did get to, we did get to the uh, edge of a, a river, the Germans on one side and we was on the other side and both sides had banks, that is, shoulders on them. We could see them walking around out there and we'd be walking around and nobody was shooting at each other. We, you only shot when you were supposed to, I guess. But then uh, we did get, uh, we was at the edge of a forest. We did get uh, firing into the woods and the trees and getting showered with small branches and sticks and such as that. So we found out how to protect ourselves from the from the broken limbs and such so you wouldn't get stabbed and such and that. But then uh, that was really about the first first initiation of it. So then uh, when well then a little later when we were approaching Hurlesheim why we uh, we took cover behind some some uh, railroad tracks and, and the banks of some uh, canals. Uh, we could, we could see a lot of Germans out in front of us, and we figured we captured something like 750 Germans that day without firing a shot. They wanted to give up. They just hold their hands up in the air or hold something white up in the air. Or, and raise up, but uh, none of our fellows ever shot any. But th th the Germans was more afraid of, afraid of the being shot in the back by their own German army than they was of the Americans taking them. So uh, we we thought we was pretty lucky that day. And then about 4:30 that evening, why we we moved forward and we come to a, a wall around the Hurlesheim itself. Most people are not familiar with those little towns over there being walled in with with concrete or such. But they here a hundred years ago or more, why they was there was more more thievery and things going on, and they found out it was better to live in town than it was out on the farm. So while we we were come to this wall. Uh, we was kind of talking about who's going who's going to be the first one over the wall so we can handle the gun and shells and things over and about that time a mortar shell landed right in the middle of us and didn't go off so we we hurried up then and got things over over the wall and got in in town before dark and got into a barn with yeah there was uh, 21 21 of us in a barn. Uh, no officers as such or anything. We had some non-coms and privates and privates, privates first class. But uh, we they, we got shelled all night. Uh, and across the street from us was a chicken house. Just this chicken house got hit about two o'clock in the morning with a shell and scattered chickens all over everything and one of the chickens got clear across the street and got got up against our barn and a little later later German was crawling up along the edge of the barn he was no doubt going to probably throw a hand grenade in the barn or something. he was about five feet from the door and uh, he crawled under that chicken and that chicken went buck, 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 you know and alerted us and, uh, and the guard at the door shot him but didn't kill him. But he laid out there and groaned and up till about 4.30 and, and uh, about 4 o'clock we could hear this German tank down the street. But we didn't have anything that would knock out a German tank, just rifle and machine guns. And the Germans got closer to us, we could see that there was eight or ten German soldiers walking around the tank in front of it and both sides of it. My biggest worry was that somebody going to get scared and start shooting them, but then that didn't take place. But about that time, one of the Germans 
starts hollering, comes he out, comes he out. So we tore the machine gun apart and threw things all over the barn and I done the same thing with my rifle and so the people started getting out of the barn and there was 21 of us and we all made it all right. This was about 4.30 in the morning. And then my best buddy was down the street someplace and he got he got captured someplace between 8 and 10 in the morning. And my company commander and battalion commander got captured about 10 or 10.30 in the morning. They was in a house that was burning. They had to get out or get burned up themselves, so they, they got captured too. Uh, I never knew until a long time later that in the two weeks previous to us getting into Hurlesheim, that the Americans had lost something like 67 German tanks to the Germans. We didn't have anything that would knock out a German tank that, at, at that time. And that's how I happened to get captured. I, that German tank had his tank aimed right at the barn door we was at. If we had put up a fight why, and they'd have fired the gun, why, I probably wouldn't be here today. So I think we done the right thing. Not, not fun being captured, but that's what happened. And we figured it was about 20 degrees below zero. Pretty cold. Yeah. And we, the Germans marched us to Baden-Baden, Germany. That was six, a matter of six or seven miles. We crossed the Rhine River on, on pontoons with boards laid on pontoons across the river. And then and they marched us to an older schoolhouse that had several buildings with it. And that's where they put me in the first place. So then I uh, had been there overnight and the next day my best buddy was walking up the street with a, another bunch of prisoners and uh, I saw him and I I hollered at him and waved at him and I stepped out the door, got his attention and they kept marching him on past. But about 15 or 20 minutes I looked up and here, he, here my buddy was back with me. I, I said, what'd you do? And he said, well, I just took off and come back to get there with you. And nobody interfered, so uh, he didn't get shot and I didn't get shot. And we spent the rest of the war together till we both got discharged. Now, tell me about the conditions in the prisoner of war camp. Well, I was in five different camps to my period in, in the rest of the war. Mm -hmm. uh, every one of them was uh, more or less horse barns. Uh, Germany hadn't went mechanized yet. They still had most of their guns pulled by horses and, and uh, so uh, the first, first uh, when they took us out of Baden Baden, they they loaded us on a on a cattle car or horse car or whichever one, but it was uh, for livestock and uh, built for forty men or eight horses. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but they they. They didn't stop at 40 men. They they loaded, uh, I think, 105 of us in that car. But we we, we didn't do too bad. We uh, they moved us about, uh, I think, uh, something like 24 hours to another camp, and uh, we stayed there a couple of weeks. And the the uh, Allies has got closer to us, and then they moved us back and put us on another train. Uh, but we on that way, I think we was in there two days and no no water or no no eats or anything. And then put us in another camp. And then we, uh, we uh, that same thing happened when the Allies got somewhat closer. Uh, this time they made us walk. We walked to uh, the third camp I was in and this is when uh, I can't think of the Patton. Patton, yeah. Patton ordered that 
patent thing of uh, he got it, uh, one of his fourth armored division colonels to put together something like 300 men and vehicles to try to get about 40 to 60 kilometers up to get his son-in-law out of prison. He was in the same prison in a camp uh, about a half a mile down the road from where uh, we were at. Uh, of course, we didn't know anything about it or what was going on, but we did hear that one morning in March, we heard the rifle fire and and a lot of gunfire and such. We and gunfire was even hitting our our area. And we we knew something was going on, but we didn't have any idea what. But the guards all took off for a while, but in a little bit they all came back. So uh, then they moved us on to another, moved us on uh, to, the, to the fourth camp. And uh, then we, uh, I don't know, we was there a month or so. And then we moved, on, they moved us on to Mooseburg, was the, was the final one. And uh, there was something like 22,000 22, soldiers from different com countries, France, England, United States, and, and, then, and even even more. It was in the Mooseburg. And the 14th Armored Division came through about 10 o'clock on, on uh, April the 29th. We could see the dust flying and hear the roar of the motors and hear the tracks a mile away or more. So the Germans took off. As soon as they took off, well then some of the American officers took over. But it was this was say ten o'clock, ten thirty. The middle of the afternoon, well, they had some white bread in there for us, but that was uh, tasted like angel food cake. So, uh, but uh, things didn't pick up much as far as food or anything. Uh, we didn't didn't get any change of clothes or new clothes or baths or anything till the planes come in to pick us up on May the eighth and got us back to Camp Lucky Strike when we could take a bath and take a shower, get some new clothes and... Yeah. You get, also mentioned that there was eggnog, a lot of eggnog? Oh yeah, yeah, they had eight eight gallon milk cans sitting around every place that, so we could drink plenty of milk and eat plenty of eggs. Mm -hmm. But then uh, they didn't want us to overeat either. Some, you could overload your stomach and kill yourself. But, uh, we just we stayed at Camp Lucky Strike just a uh, just a, a week. I was fortunate enough to get loaded on a boat and get across the channel and load on some more. That was a SS John Erickson, and and uh, I don't remember exactly exactly what day it was we hit New York, but about. Uh, must have been about May the 30th or something like that. May the 29th, we hit New York Harbor. I was back home in Rochester, Indiana on June the 2nd. That was my dad's birthday, so it couldn't have, it couldn't have worked any better for me. And then we had, we had 60 days furlough. Then we had to go to Miami Beach for a week. And then they sent me back to Fort Hayes, and then Fort Hayes sent from, that's with Humbus, Ohio, and they sent me from there to Camp Atterbury, uh, just south of Indianapolis, Indiana, and that's where I was released. Of course, the, the uh, I should put in here too that when we left Miami Beach, they loaded us on a train we hadn't left the station yet, and we noticed every, all this noise and dancing in the streets and everything. We couldn't figure out what was going on, but that was the end of the war in Japan. So I didn't get to support the, the war or the, the war in Japan. We didn't get to celebrate any, and we didn't get to celebrate any of the World War Two. And so anyway, it was it was all good. Good for the best, though, I suppose. Now, I want to go back to a couple of things you mentioned earlier. Uh, first, you talked about your buddy who had the other machine gun squad. Uh, what was his name? 
uh, Eugene Red Smith from and, Chillicothe, Ohio. And you said you also, after spending time in the camps with him, also came home with him at the, the same yes, time? Yes, right, right. Yes, we, we got together in Camp Camel, and he was made a leader of one machine gun squad, and I was made a leader of another. And the way they had it set up was, of the four guns, uh, one and two was to work together, and three and four was to work together. And that's why Smitty and I worked together for two years on training and such as that. And then we we got to, we went overseas all together, and he was a young guard duty when I was on guard duty. And, and then we got overseas, and we still was together. And uh, so, uh, he wasn't in the same. He wasn't in the same half track with me. But then uh, we were still in the same squad. Well, we each had a squad. We was in the same mortar platoon. Uh, but as as seeing my squad leader, or I mean my mortar platoon leader, lieutenant, and all, I never saw him after after we ever started battle. Yeah, but he was a man. He was on. He was on your own boss, I guess. If they didn't look you up, you didn't look them up either, so we, uh, it was, I don't know, we was with other companies, other with other divisions even, when I was captured. 136 to, for one, and uh, you didn't really know who you was with. Now, when you were a prisoner of war, uh, did you have to do any labor, any work for the Germans? Well, I, I'm not sure that I call it labor. I'm on, I either went once or I could have gone twice. It's too many time, too many years ago. But they sent us out to pick up firewood, and uh, uh, they did have some places where they would build fires, but they didn't build them in the horse barns. And uh, I don't know where the wood ever went. But then that was that was what I was supposed to do. So uh, that's the only work I ever had to do. Just two days out of the. 109, I was a prisoner. Now, when you were a prisoner of the Germans, what kind of food was provided, food and medical care? C can you tell us anything about that? Well, very, very, very little medical care. Uh, Smitty, my buddy, got grazed by, a, by a, a bullet in the back of a hand, and uh, that got sore for him. and. Uh, he did find a, a, a German uh, guy that would had some salve of some kind. I don't know what it was, but uh, he let him have some of it, and uh, it finally healed. But uh, myself, I was never, I was never uh, scratched or scraped or anything else. But uh, the, the medical part of it was pretty poor. Uh, they just didn't have anything to give you. I, I'm I'm sure of that, and they they would say they would tell you that, but I'm I think they was right too. Uh, they just didn't have things like we did. Like I said, myself when I was when I was a squad leader and all, I I carried I carried medical stuff right on my belt. So if you got shot, why well, I could relieve your pain, you know, or if if you needed some. Band-Aids and stuff, I could give them to you, but then uh, uh, I was never, I was never injured, and, and I never had to, I never had to give up my, my medicine or uh, painkiller to anybody until the Germans took it away from me when I was captured. Now, how about food? What kind of food was provided? Well, uh, they liked rotten cabbage pretty well. I mean, the Germans did because they fed a lot of us. They fed us a lot of it. Uh, very, very few potatoes. Once in a while, you might get a potato. Once in a while, you might get a, a small carrot. Uh, that was. And once in a while, we might get some horse meat. We knew it was horse meat because they wouldn't put anything else. They had plenty of horses, you know. They, didn't, they wouldn't put any cattle meat in there or anything, but they had plenty of horses. And uh, 
No, but but we might go two or three days. They they would give you maybe one meal a day with some spoiled cabbage soup, and uh, they was great on on white bread uh, that wasn't cut. It, it was hauled in on the horse and wagon, wasn't wrapped or anything. And they had it quartered up like cordwood. Uh, one day. One day they might come in and say, uh, you have to divide this loaf of bread between ten men today. If you had a, if you had a knife, you was really lucky. If you had got in a ten-man group that didn't have a, a knife, you know how ten men would divide up a loaf of bread by jerking some out, you know. So that's the way, it, that's the way. The, the portions you got, you might you might get. Uh, well, the next day or two days later or three days later, why well, you might get, they might bring in a loaf of, or another wagon load of bread, but say you, you got to divide this today between six men. It wasn't always the same, and uh, they didn't care whether you had a knife in the in the group or not because, and they just leave you as dead as they they just leave you as dead as. Uh, being a good, good American soldier, so uh, uh, it was, the the food was was real poor. Just, and but I should I should give the Red Cross credit here. The, uh, the National Red Cross and the American Red Cross and the English Red Cross uh, through the times that we marched between camps. And that's about the only time we got them. They would have maybe a truck load. At an intersection or something like that, that we were we was going to cross, and uh, they'd have a box about say ten by ten by ten, load, loaded with some cookies, some soap, a few cigarettes, some sugar cubes, maybe a small can of liver pate, and uh, that would be about it. But it was a lifesaver. Uh, we we enjoyed the American boxes the best, but then he was glad to get any of them. And uh, that happened, I think, two or four times while we was marching. And uh, uh, got to ask you one more question about the interrogator. Oh, okay. Uh, inter interrogator. Well, the interrogator was a nice-looking young German, about 21 to 23 or 4 years old, and. He got a little loud at first when all I would do was just give him my serial or my serial number, and uh, but then he finally cooled down a little and and uh, he told me that he was employed at the Willie's Oberland Jeep plant in uh, Toledo. Huh? Toledo. Uh, Toledo, Ohio. Toledo, Ohio. And he went home on on uh, vacation, and they kept him. He couldn't get back to the United States. He would have been glad to, I'm sure, but he just couldn't do that. Now he cooled down and and uh, was just as friendly as he could be. But then, uh, yeah. So uh, he was he was glad to tell me, I guess, too, that he wasn't afraid to, of that. But then. Uh, but the, the worst part of it was, as far as Germans, they get pretty loud and and uh, talk tough. But they they really didn't do that much to me. I mean, uh, uh, things got to the conditions over there that they couldn't help themselves. Really, they didn't have anything to give you, and and uh, uh, the, the ordinary German was in was in a bad situation themselves. But they they couldn't afford to do anything but go along with the Nazis or they, they was out of luck. In the area where I was captured at, uh, that area had swung back and forth between the French and the Germans for centuries. There was, there was uh, so many Frenchmen in there that they didn't know whether they was French or German, and then that, that area was uh, noted for 
the swings back and forth. But I never, I never was in one place long enough that I could get acquainted with people. I've talked to, I've talked to past VA people that have gone back over there and run some of those people down that they stayed with or lived close to or talked to. Uh, but I never got that situation. I had a good friend that was captured in the Battle of the Bulge. He made a trip back over there with, with his family. I think there was 16 members of his family went back over there and he saw some of the nuns that was in the, in the, where he was held and uh, they, they enjoyed it but then I, I, I didn't, wouldn't even care to go back at all. I got tired of uh, the French kids wanting chocolate bars. Chocolate today, chocolate, chocolate, you know, so I, I had enough of that. I, I was glad to get home. Well, is there anything else you want to add or you feel you want to talk about? Well, no, I, 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 would, I would like to give the, the VA a, a pat on the back. Cause, so as far as I'm concerned, I, I was never hurt or injured. Hadn't really been sick, but uh, they've taken care of me like I'm a member of the family and uh, and bent over backwards to to help me out. And I'm a well when the when the doctor got up to 220 degree uh, on on my on my chart for what he could pay me for. He said, well, they're only going to pay for for a hundred anyway, so we just as well stop here. So, <laughs> so they, they have uh, been real good on that. Uh, when my wife was living, uh, they was even giving her 10% to take care of me. But when she, when she passed away, uh, then I lost that 10%. But by the same token, uh, they're, I'm, they're just paying me 90% of being uh, with my, all my problems, but they're paying me 10% because I can't take care of myself. So, uh, I, I like I say, I have to give them a pat on the back. But, by the same token, this only started in about the middle of the 90s. It didn't, it didn't start when we come home. It started in maybe the middle of the 90s, but didn't get up to 100% till probably 2000. Most people don't know that, and most a lot of people don't think I I'm owed a thing. That was the duty of, I should have done for my country, and I did do it for my country, and I I was happy with that. But when they other people started getting things, I thought I would do it too. So I. Well, sir, I want to thank you for sitting down with me. Thank you for sharing your story with me. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope somebody... Uh, okay? Okay, we have one additional story. You need to tell me about the house fire. Well, just before Christmas in 1944, we'd been up to the front, say, for a good month and a half. And uh, some reason or another, this, somehow or another, it worked out that the 36th Infantry or the 37th, I don't remember which, division was going to relieve us for a few days. The fort, we were relieved the 4th so that they could go up to the Battle of the Bulge and help out. And we had been there ever since. Well, then, uh, uh, we, wasn't, they, we, wasn't, we wasn't going back or anything. We were just to go back a mile or two and out of, away from the front lines and find some place to rest and relax for a few days through Christmas. Well, Smitty and I went together with our squads and we found a French house in this little town that looked pretty good to us that we thought we could maybe get in and get warm. And we uh, looked the house over. We, st we went up the stairs and right at the at halfway up the stairs, why it made a, made the turn, and and on that turn was a, a fireplace. 
We thought, boy, this is for us. We can build a fire in there and keep warm. We didn't know the fireplace was a f false one. So we did, uh, we did uh, know that the French people got a little loud and a little angry, but we didn't realize it was a false fireplace, but we built one in there anyway. Well, we burnt the house down and uh, uh, Bill, Bill Funky told me some years ago that he remembers that house burn. He, he didn't know what had happened and I told him the story. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we didn't get, we didn't get in, in a warm place and we had to go back to sleeping in barns. So uh, by that, I, uh, I, want, I want to tell you too, that in the winter of 1944 and the winter of 1945, say if the time we left England until I got back to La Havre, France on May of 45, I was never in a heated building. Uh, I was in horse barns. If you wanted a hot drink of water or something, well, you didn't get it there. You, uh, you went to the, out, to the, out to the water pump that was at the horse tank, and it was a pitcher pump. I never saw any any hot running water or cold running water. I think they must have had a quarter corner on the pitcher pump business because every pump over there had a pitcher pump on it. And you'd find that at the horse tank out in the in the barnyard. Not in the barn. Lots of fun. Lots of fun. <laughs>